American Horror Story. Is there anything this show hasn't covered? Over its eight year tenure, Ryan Murphy stuck just about everything in there from sadistic surgeons to aliens and psychotic nuns to bloodthirsty ghosts to not one, but two literal insane clown posses. The show has given us iconically badass witches, sumptuous vampires, and even a troublingly attractive antichrist. Up until Apocalypse, the connections between the seasons of American Horror Story were tenuous at best, mostly thanks to the cameos from characters with main storylines in different seasons, like when Queenie shows up at the Hotel Cortez in American Horror Story 4. Then Apocalypse happened and everything finally clicked, confirming that yes, the seasons all took place in the same universe on the same timeline and that the events of one season had serious effects on the following seasons. But because American Horror Story covers a massive span of time, this timeline gets pretty complex. A lot of events from different seasons occur simultaneously and oh yeah, don't forget about the completely alternate timeline that Mallory creates an apocalypse by time traveling using the power of Tempest Infinitum. Wrapping your head around everything that happens during the course of this series is almost as challenging as performing the Seven Wonders, but we're here to guide you through the dark. I'm Jacob with Cinematica, and this is the American Horror Story Timeline, just in time for 1984. Roanoke History, 1500s. It's safe to say that outside of storylines involving divine beings like Satan, who've been around since almost the beginning of humanity, the earliest major event in the series takes place in Roanoke in the 1500s. The witch, Scathish, steps off the boat in the colonies and quickly ascends to the position of Supreme, making her the first known Supreme in the New World, at least according to the series. Then in 1587, John White, leader of Roanoke, goes traipsing off, leaving his wife, Thomason, in charge in the interim. Like many women in history, she's brutally punished after a few years of trying to make any kind of influential decisions in her husband's absence, and the villagers and her own ungrateful son clap a scold's bridle on her and banish her to the forest to die. She's saved by Scathage, who essentially buys Thomason's soul from her. After becoming Scathage's number one stand, Thomason returns to the village and makes everyone commit human sacrifices to her girl Gaga, and when Thomason finds out that the villagers aren't super into it, she goes on a mass murdering spree before letting Scathage kill her, effectively bonding everybody's souls to the land and turning herself into the Butcher, an immortal servant of Scathage who emerges during the Blood Moon every October. Oh, also in Apocalypse, we learn that in 1590, when all of this is going down at Roanoke, another enterprising witch named Agnes Sampson figures out a particularly gory way to kill warlocks, but she's burned at the stake before she can get to those boys. Something that'll allow all of us to enjoy Billy Porter's portrayal of the warlock Behold, but also, you know, leaving the path to ascension for the Antichrist wide open. Coven history, 1700s to 1800s. For about 200 years after that, Scathage reigned supreme in the American colonies. Then in Coven, we learn about another supreme. Prudence Mather is a witch who escapes the Salem Trials in 1692 with her coven. They eventually set up shop down in New Orleans without Dear Prudence and get into a turf war with the voodoo queens who already live there. It's hard to imagine that rivalry without Madame LaLaurie and Marie Laveau, but they aren't even born until 1787 and 1801, respectively. Also in New Orleans, Miss Robichaux's Academy for Exceptional Young Ladies opens in 1790 as a finishing school for wealthy girls, a totally normal build devoid of witchcraft at the time. Two years later, the ill-fated Edward Philippe Mott builds the Shaker Mansion on top of the Roanoke site and then dies promptly at the hands of the Butcher. Don't worry though, the Mott family line continues on in his descendant Dandy Mott, who we have the misfortune to meet in Freak Show. In 1830, Madame LaLaurie moves in with her daughters to New Orleans. After three long years of stomaching their mother's signature sadistic skincare regimen, the daughters plot to kill her. Madame LaLaurie hears about their plans and imprisons them in a slave cage, which is a bad call for everyone. Around the same time, Marie Laveau summons Papa Legbine, gives her firstborn son to him in exchange for immortality. Despite Madame LaLaurie's crimes against her slaves, Marie Laveau doesn't really get involved with her until one of the imprisoned daughters tries to rape a slave named Bastion. In her typical fashion, LaLaurie decides to go super sadistic and she affixes a severed bull's head to Bastion's head as punishment, killing him in the process. Little does she know that Bastion is Marie Laveau's lover. Looking for revenge, Laveau murders LaLaurie's family, then makes her immortal and buries her alive so that she can live with the grief of seeing her dead family for eternity. Ryan Murphy really likes making Kathy Bates disgruntled and immortal, as we'll see throughout the series. Oh, and Marie Laveau also tries to resurrect poor Bastion, but it doesn't exactly go as planned since he comes back as a minotaur instead of himself. I mean, what did you think was gonna happen? After this incident, their rivalry takes a time out through the 1860s when that whole civil war thing is happening. During this period, Miss Robichaux is repurposed as a hospital and later converted into the witch school we've come to know. Hotel history, 1890s to 1910s. It's nearly the turn of the century. 1893, and back in Roanoke, serial killer Kincaid Polk is going whole hog. Uh, well, okay, his pigs are going whole hog on it. They eat him alive. The, the pigs eat him alive. Much like poor Bastion, he returns from the dead as half man, half beast, and becomes the piggy man, who joins the butcher in terrorizing the poor inhabitants of the Shaker house for all time. A couple years later, Rudolph Valentino and James March are born, both destined for the Hotel Cortez 
a torrid love affair with Elizabeth Johnson, and a largely uncomfortable immortality. Also around this time, Edward Mordrake, a murderous, two-faced freak from England, joins a circus and slaughters his whole troop on Halloween, cementing him in legend and also granting him an uncomfortable immortality. Really, uncomfortable immortality is a lot of what American Horror Story is ultimately about. Well, to be fair, there is also a lot of uncomfortable mortality too. Uh, in 1910, Briarcliff Manor is built and becomes the largest tuberculosis ward on the East Coast, which means something like 46,000 patients die there before it's shuttered. Legend has it that once you were committed at Briarcliff, you never got out. In 1919, back at Ms. Robichaux's, the witches in the coven trap a particularly jazzy serial killer called the Axe Man in the Academy and kill him, thus binding his spirit to the house. A few years pass, and in 1922, Murder House is built by Dr. Charles Montgomery, Surgeon to the Stars, and I think we all remember how well that turns out. Around the same time, the Hotel Cortez goes up around town, and while it's not explicitly called the Murder Hotel, wealthy developer slash serial killer James March built it for that express purpose, and he gets to work on getting his hands dirty. <laughs> Anyway, remember our old friend Rudolph? Well, he comes to stay at the hotel after it opens. Elizabeth Johnson falls in love with him before he contracts vampirism from a doctor during a movie. A year goes by before she sees him again, and thinking Rudolph has died, Elizabeth marries James March for the money. The truth comes out, in both cases, and Elizabeth makes the best of it. She convinces James to murder the rich if he must murder, we at Cinematica will always stand an anti-capitalist queen, and she becomes a vampire too. She plans to run away with Rudolph and his wife Natasha so that they can travel the world together as a vampire power Thruple. But James finds out and traps Natasha and Rudolph in the walls of the hotel, cask of Amontillado style. Elizabeth, the epitome of drama, believes they've abandoned her and decides to become the Countess, now with the express goal of seducing beautiful people and turning them into vampires like herself. James, for his part, freaks out in a different way and begins the Ten Commandments killings. Meanwhile, across the country, the town from Cult, Brookfield Heights, Michigan, is established, but before we get to that particularly frightening place, we're joining the circus for a while. Freak Show History, 1920s to 1960s. In 1928, business is booming for freak shows, and poor sweet lobster claw Jimmy Darling is born in a live freak birth to strongman Del Toledo and bearded woman Ethel Darling. This cements his rocky relationship with his mother and with the circus for the next decade. In 1932, Elsa Mars is drugged and kidnapped in Germany, where her assistant, a Nazi doctor named Hans Gruper, films the act of amputating both of her legs before attempting to kill her in a snuff film. She escapes and over the next decade adopts Pepper, yes, the same Pepper from from Asylum and starts her freak show where she recruits Jimmy and his family to perform along with the rest of her troupe. In 1941, the murderous conman Stanley uses Maggie Esmeralda, who's posing as a fortune teller, to gain access to Elsa's freaks so that he can kill them and sell their body parts, or in Ma Petit's case, her whole body, to museums dedicated to showcasing the macabre for a profit. A few years later, Twisty the Clown escapes the traveling carnival he's with and opens his own toy shop, which does not go well. He unsuccessfully attempts suicide by putting a shotgun in his mouth, hence that scary toothy mask he wears while he's on the run. In the 50s, Dot and Bette Tatler join Elsa's freak show, and Dandy Mott finds Twisty during a kill where he decides to become the clown's protege. They wind up at Elsa's freak show one night, and to protect her coterie, Elsa summons Edward Mordrake to kill Twisty, which only really makes Twisty a scary, bloodthirsty, immortal clown, but okay. Dandy is taken by Dot and Bette, who disagree about how they feel about him, but it doesn't really matter in the end, since Elsa ends up selling them to him anyway. Jimmy doesn't feel right about the situation, and rescues the twins. Dandy freaks out and murders an entire tough Tupperware party of women, making it probably the liveliest Tupperware party ever thrown. And as retribution for taking the twins, Dandy frames Jimmy for the murders. Jimmy is arrested, but in 1953, the freaks break Jimmy out of prison. They also figure out the truth about Stanley and murder him for killing their friends. Later that year, Elsa sells the freak show to Dandy for $10,000, a real steal, and things take a serious turn for the worse. When Dandy can't make money on ticket sales, he systematically murders the freaks one by one with the exception of the twins who agree to marry him under clear duress. Things work out in the end, though, when the remaining freaks trick Dandy into climbing into a Chinese water torture device where they drown him. That's not how Chinese water torture works at all. Dandy's house, the Shaker Mansion in Roanoke, goes up for sale. Elsa gets a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and then she kills herself by performing on Halloween, much to the delight of Edward Mordrake. By 1960, Jimmy and the twins are pregnant. In 1961, Marie Laveau is reanimating corpses to kill off a racist lynch mob in Louisiana, and in 1962, Briarcliff Manor reopens in Maryland as an insane asylum. Asylum History, 1962 to 1967. The very same year that Briarcliff opens, Pepper is committed there, having been framed for the murder of her sister's baby. The Reverend Monsignor, who runs the asylum, agrees to let Dr. Arthur Arden, the doctor formerly known as Hans Gruper, who you may remember from cutting off Elsa Mars's legs, conduct experiments on the patients there. So what could possibly go 
wrong. In the next few years, Kid Walker and Lee Emerson are committed for mass murders, though in Kit's case wrongfully so, and a journalist named Lana Winters attempts to sneak in after hours but is caught and committed for being queer. She's tortured with electroshock therapy, and in the meantime, Kit's wife Alma is abducted by extraterrestrials. At this point, sure, why not? Also at this point in the season, there's a really weird plot point with Anne Frank, but you know what, we're just gonna, we're just gonna skip past that. Anne Frank, uh, whoever she is. In 1964, Lana manages to break out of Briarcliff with a patient named Oliver Threadson, but when they get out, he tells her that he's the real bloody face killer and holds her hostage. Their car crashes and Lana wakes up back in Briarcliff and is all, F one of the security guards, Frank, is murdered by Sister Eunice, who's possessed by a demon, by the way, because of course she is. But Demon Eunice pins it on Sister Jude, who's committed as a patient and tortured nearly to death. Grace and Pepper are abducted by the previously mentioned aliens and return to Briarcliff in 1965 alive and extremely pregnant. Sister Eunice is thrown from the roof of Briarcliff by Monseigneur, and Dr. Arden futzes around with her dead body without realizing that she's been kissed by the angel of death, so he dies. This season is wild, y'all. Kit, Grace, and Lana are released from Briarcliff, but Pepper dies in its confines. By the time Kit returns home with Grace, his abducted wife Alma's been returned safe and sound. Well, maybe not too sound, since she promptly dispatches Grace with an axe. We have to open it. <laughs> Lana writes a bestseller on her year-long tenure at Briarcliff and exposes Oliver as the bloody face killer before gunning him down in his home. In 1967, Kit can't handle Alma's alien talk and checks her into Briarcliff, which is a pretty dick move in my opinion, but hey, she didn't cut down my girlfriend, so. Either way, Alma ends up dying in Briarcliff before it's abandoned and shut down in 1971, following the success of Lana Winter's television expose of the facilities. Murder House History, 1968 to 1994. Over in LA in 1968, someone thought it was a great idea to convert Murder House into a sorority house for nursing students, and it ends up about the way you'd think it would, with lots of blood, and not like blood as in their nursing students. It's not like that. The house goes back on the market, and Constance Langdon, an aspiring actress from Virginia, buys it and moves in, hoping to make it big in LA. Oh, and don't forget, this is also just about when Fiona murders Anna Lee Layton down at Miss Robichaux's in New Orleans in order to become the new Supreme, okay? All right. In 1972, Monsignor slits his wrist in the bathtub, overcome with guilt following the closure of Briarcliff. Constance gives birth to Adelaide, her first child, who's born differently abled, then gives up on her acting dreams to raise her, though I'm not sure what Constance puts Adelaide through can really be called raising a child. Sometime after, Constance also gives birth to another differently abled child, Bo, whom she keeps chained up in the attic at Murder House, naturally. Meanwhile, it's the same old story over at the Roanoke House. In 1973, a nice family, the Chens, move in and are promptly dispatched by the butcher. Over at Hotel Cortez, the Countess is still a breaking hearts and taking names and humanity. She seduces and turns a B-movie queen, Ramona Royale, and the two start a long-standing love affair. Five years later, Constance gives birth to her second child, a boy named Tate, and abandons Murder House with the intention of refurbishing it and moving back in. The next year, in 1978, while the Murder House is abandoned, two neighborhood kids venture into the house, only to be brutally murdered by the atrocity that is the Infantata, the hideous result of Charles Montgomery's attempts to resurrect the child his wife Nora killed in the house. The 80s roll around and Kid is abducted by the aliens, which is a fair price to pay for gaslighting his wife to death, if you ask me. Murder House is fully refurbished and Constance moves back in with her kids. She catches her husband cheating on her with the maid Moira and, well, murders them both, if the name of the house doesn't clue you in on what happens here. In 1984, the Countess takes in a woman named Nick Pryor, but instead of turning her, helps her transition into Liz Taylor, who, like her namesake, is fabulous. She has Liz work at the hotel and treats Liz with kindness and affection. Another unfortunate duo moves into the Shaker house in Roanoke in 1988, although this time the occupants, Miranda and Bridget Jane, are no less evil than the butcher, really. They open up Shaker House as an assisted living facility, though with these two in charge, it's more of an assisted dying facility. Their ageist killing spree ends when the butcher takes them out. In the early 90s, a man named Larry Harvey moves into the murder house with his wife and two kids. When she finds out that he's been seduced by Constance, his wife self-immolates, taking her two kids with her in the flames. Constance and her family move back in, this time with Larry. Meanwhile, Ramona and the Countess split, and Ramona falls in love with a man who calls himself the Prophet Moses. She turns him, and they build a crew together until the Countess wipes out all of them but Ramona. Ramona's all, We were on a break! But as we already know, the Countess doesn't do breaks. Back at the murder house, Larry smothers Bo with a pillow at Constance's behest, prompting Tate to light him on fire. Tate then goes on a rage-induced shooting spree at his school, killing 15 students before a SWAT chase him back to murder house and shoot him down there. Hotel history continued, 1994 to 2012. By now it's 1994, and two junkies, Sally and Donovan, check into Hotel Cortez to shoot up. Donovan's mother, Iris, follows them and in a fit of rage murders Sally for turning her son into a junkie, trapping Sally's spirit in the hotel. 
Donovan is saved from the brink of overdose by the Countess, who turns him into a vampire and her main love interest. Iris comes on as the hotel manager because apparently murdering people gets you some pretty good street cred with vampires and serial killer ghosts. Who would have thought? In 1997, Elias Cunningham films the history of the Roanoke House. Then, not much happens in the American Horror Story universe until 2010, when a gay couple named Chadwick and Patrick move into the murder house in order to flip it, but they're murdered by the rubber man before they can do so. Then, a family, Ben, Vivian, and their daughter Violet move into the murder house. Violet then becomes romantic with Tate's ghost. Meanwhile, across town, Detective John Lowe comes to the Hotel Cortez for the first time, and he meets with the ghost of James Marsh, who convinces him to continue the Ten Commandments killings. Time gets all wonky for stuff with John Lowe because he's all messed up, but basically over the next four years, John both personally sees out these Ten Commandment copycat killings and is the lead investigator in the cases until nearly the end of the hotel season, where he comes to and realizes what he's done and who he is. Back at Murder House, Violet commits suicide with pills in order to be with Tate, and the rubber man and Ben simultaneously impregnate Vivian. In 2012, she gives birth to two children. One, Ben's child, is stillborn. The other, the son of the rubber man, aka Tate, is alive and healthy. Vivian dies from complications during childbirth, and Constance takes the healthy baby Michael to raise as her own. And yeah, you guessed it, he grows up to become that Michael Langdon, the Antichrist and Apocalypse who proves to be such a thorn in all the witches' sides. Speaking of witches, coven history continued, 2013 to 2015. In 2013, Cordelia finds and recruits new witches to teach at Ms. Robichaux's Academy. The new recruits are Queenie, Nan, Madison, Misty, and Zoe, each of whom had been chosen for displaying different strange powers. They're not only being taught the ways of magic, but also being groomed to take on the role of Supreme when Fiona passes, which doesn't sit well with Fiona. Remember how she got the position of Supreme in the first place? To help prevent this, Fiona digs up Madame LaLaurie and forces her to keep an eye on Madison specifically, seemingly the most powerful of the five. Laveau is not having that, however, and a war breaks out between the Coven and the voodoo practitioners. There's a very strange hookup between Queenie and the Minotaur, and she gets gravely injured. Fiona cuts off the bull's head and sends it to Marie as a warning. Marie obviously is far from pleased, considering that the Minotaur was her former beau Bastion. She throws acid in Cordelia's face, burning out her eyes and rendering her blind, but gifting her with the sight, which allows her to see visions, specifically visions of Fiona killing Madison. Myrtle is framed for this attack and burned at the stake. Fiona eventually kills Madison herself, fearing that she's about to become supreme. But Misty resurrects her and Myrtle when she joins the coven. When Myrtle comes back to life, she murders the two members of the witch's council that sentenced her to death and restores Cordelia's eyesight by gifting her one eye from each of them. How thoughtful. But it only winds up getting her put back on the stake where she burns for real this time, giving us one of the most iconic scenes of the series. The five new recruits perform the Seven Wonders, leaving only Queenie alive by the end of the trials. Cordelia becomes the new Supreme, something which Fiona tries in vain to stop by summoning Papa Legba and offering up her soul. He claps back at her that she has no soul to give, though. She dies in Cordelia's arms. After Cordelia ascends to Supreme, she goes public with the fact that witches exist and the warlocks move underground to Hawthorne, fearing discrimination. Cult history, 2015 to 2018. Meanwhile, Shelby and Matt Miller move into the Roanoke house and barely make it out alive. Their experiences inspire a reality TV show called My Roanoke Nightmare. Multiple film crews die shooting the series, which airs in 2015 to much acclaim. In Michigan, a young Kai and Winter visit the Judgment House, where Pastor Charles is torturing his inhabitants. Kai kills the pastor, an act which later earns some points with Ivy, one of the cult's new recruits. Fashion designer Will Drake buys the Hotel Cortez and marries the Countess, and Ramona kills Queenie, draining her of blood and thus trapping her in the hotel. Years later, Cordelia will try to rescue Queenie at the hotel, but it won't work. Only Michael can free her, which earns him enough trust with the coven that they're willing to let him perform the Seven Wonders to see if he truly is the Alpha. Back in 2015, John Lowe kills the Countess, completing James March's Ten Commandments. Michael Langdon is growing up in Constance's care, showing all the signs of your average budding serial killer, gutting small animals, killing his nanny, you know, kid stuff. But then he ages a decade overnight and almost strangles Constance before he stops himself. Feeling like a failed mother, Constance commits suicide. Then we have 2016, the year that Donald Trump runs for office and eventually becomes president, which is the actual scariest thing that happens in this series. It's a good thing that this is escapist drama and would never happen in the real world. Oh wait. Cult focuses on this election, filtered through the experiences of a budding cult leader, Kai, and his devotees, who are based out of Brookfield Heights, Michigan. At the beginning of the season, Ali and Ivy are a lesbian couple with a son who feel threatened by their conservative neighbors, the Wiltons. Kai's queer sister, Winter, seduces Ivy, and convinces Ivy to join the cult by helping her get revenge on 
Gary, a Trump supporter who groped her at a Hillary rally. They chain him to a poll the day before the election, and Kai convinces him to saw off his own arm in order to go vote. Donald Trump wins the election, and Kai's cult murders several people while wearing costumes designed to look like Twisty the Clown from Freak Show. Allie joins Kai's cult in 2017 as a secret informant for the FBI. Soon after, Kai learns that there's a mole in the cult and kills Winter, believing she's the weak link. The mole actually turns out to be a local militia man named Speedwagon. Allie kills him. Eventually, Kai is thrown in jail, and Allie runs for Senate, although Kai breaks out of jail in 2018 to make an attempt on Allie's life. He fails, gunned down by the always loyal Beverly Hope. Apocalypse History, 2018 to 2024. While all of this is going down, young Michael Langdon is being raised by Mead, a Satanist who will later be made into an android. He kills a butcher, a butcher, not the butcher, and gets locked up, but the warlocks spring him from the prison, suspecting he is the Alpha, the strongest male witch. He goes and rescues Madison and Queenie, aces the Seven Wonders, and voila, he is crowned the Alpha. They quickly learn that he is the Antichrist, though, so... oops. Back in Roanoke, the lone survivor of Return to Roanoke kills herself, and the Roanoke house goes up in flames. The witches pin their hopes on a student named Mallory who has the power of time travel. This creates another timeline entirely, which we're gonna get to in a minute, so calm down. Michael learns that the witches have turned on him, and he breaks into Miss Robichaux's with the help of Dinah Stevens, a witch-turned-traitor. He murders almost all of the witches. Some of them, including Mallory, escape to Outpost 3, while the world outside burns in a nuclear apocalypse. Once there, Michael storms the outpost, ready to kill the newly resurrected coven, but Mallory is able to perform Tempest Infinitum before he reaches her. She goes back in time to 2015 to interrupt Michael's young life at Murder House. She mows him down with her car, making sure that he's dead, and thus launching the alternate timeline where no one but Michael has died, and the apocalypse is subverted. However, a new Antichrist is born in 2024. Will American Horror Story 1984 address the new Antichrist? From the looks of things, we're headed back in time, not forward, though with Ryan Murphy at the helm, who knows what might happen. Thanks for watching our American Horror Story timeline. Are you gonna check out the new season? Did we miss anything? Tell us in the comments. Once again, I've been Jacob with Cinematica, and we'll see you next time.